In the early 1800s, English physicist Michael Faraday was not very good at math. He, was, he had no formal education, and he didn't really know math beyond arithmetic. But he had an incredible mind for science and experimentation and for visualizing things, especially things that couldn't otherwise be seen, which made him one of the best physicists in the world in terms of understanding this new phenomenon of electricity and magnetism. And his foundation of electromagnetism transformed all of society. He invented the motor, he invented the electric generator, he described the electromagnet, and all sorts of other things. He was an amazing, amazing person, despite having some very serious drawbacks with his upbringing in terms of his education. So one of the things Faraday did is he reduced the idea of electric fields, which mathematically can be very complicated to describe, to some relatively simple pictures using what he called lines of force, and we're gonna call them electric field lines. So electric field lines are just lines that represent an electric field. And when you draw them, there's really an infinite number of them, but he came up with a couple of rules for drawing them. One of them is that your line should always be tangent to the field at that point. So if you have a field that is doing this at this spot here, the tangent line is coming up this way. So your field and your field line are tangent there. So these lines can make all sorts of cool curves and things, but at any given point, if you were to put a particle there, the particle would be pushed along that tangent line. That would be the direction of force. Uh, the next thing is that the more the lines pack together in your drawing, the more lines per area there are, the stronger the electric field. So you can glance at a drawing of electric field lines and very quickly identify where the field is strong versus where it's weak simply by looking at how closely packed those lines are together. Now you're gonna have to draw some of these lines and the rules for drawing the lines are relatively straightforward, okay? Rule number one, these lines are representing a series of vectors, so they've gotta have an arrowhead on them. And that arrowhead points in the direction that a positive charge would be pushed. So if an electric field line is pointing this way and you drop an electron there, then the electron's gonna go the other way, all right? So they point in the direction that positive charge would be pushed. So that's rule number one. The next rule is that the number of lines that enter into or leave a charge have to be proportional to that charge. So if you have two charges that are the same, they should have the same number of lines coming in and leaving uh, each other. Uh, you're never gonna have them coming in and leaving the same charge, but if they come out of this one and they go into this one and they're equal charge, they need to be the same number of lines. If this one has twice as much charge than this one, then you have twice as many lines leaving this one as going into that one. So that's your next rule. The third rule is that because these lines are telling you the direction things are gonna be pushed, they can never cross. You can't have two lines doing this because if, if they're force vectors, this plus this would add tip to tail and end up with that anyway. So because these lines represent an array of vectors, they can't ever cross each other. And then the final rule, which we'll get to the details of why later, is that inside a metal, if the charge is outside, inside of a metal, the electric field is always zero. That's an interesting fact. You can use a metal to shield things from outside electrical influences. Um, Faraday discovered this, and so we call that a Faraday cage. And like I said, we'll get to those details later. Here are a couple of examples of what some of these field lines might look like. So you can have a positive charge by itself and all of the lines radiate away from it. A negative charge, all of the lines come into it. Remember, these lines point in the direction of a positive test charge. Test charge, by the way, just means a really tiny charge. You can't measure electricity without using electricity, which means you can't measure it without changing it. So you use as tiny amount as possible so as to change it as little as you can. This third example, if you have a positive and negative charge, the, all of the field lines point from the positive to the negative. And then if you have two positive or two negative, then you have something like this. 
Okay, so suppose we have this pair of shapes here and this circle is positively charged and the line is negatively charged. What would the electric field look like here? Some of these lines are pretty easy to draw. If you were to drop a test charge right here, a proton right there, it would be repelled away from positive and attracted to negative, so it would do something like that. Uh, similarly here, it would repel and attract and you'd end up with that and it's symmetric, so it'll come down here and do that too. All right, this one here, if it's always closer to the circle than it is the line, and so it's going to, this is gonna repel straight away. Um, it's up here where things start to get a little wonky. This thing's gonna come up and then, what exactly is it gonna do here? Is it gonna like hit somewhere like right there? Or is it gonna come all the way around and hit over here? Is it gonna not quite make it and end up right there? It's hard to say. Um, it, it's quite hard to say. Uh, and it turns out that the more complicated the shape is, the harder these fields are to draw. So eventually some of these are gonna loop around like this, right? Uh, and we're gonna have another line like that coming in here. That should be straight. Uh, so these things can be complicated to draw. They can be difficult. And the harder the shape is, like if it's some weird, like say it's a stick figure, like a person, those types of electric fields can be very difficult to draw. So in this class, we're always going to stick to high symmetry and pretty simple shapes. I'm also going to be awfully forgiving if I'm grading any of these too. Uh, if you notice, my lines aren't as straight maybe as they should be, especially on this tablet. Okay, so about electric field lines inside a conductor being zero, what gives? So a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium, what that means is a conductor with nothing moving. The thing is electrons are super tiny. They have a mass of 10 to the minus 31 kilograms and the electric force is really strong. So electricity can push electrons around extremely easily, which means that on the surface of a metal, they move really, really fantastically fast. Not instantaneously, but very, very close. So. The reason you are safe from being struck by lightning when you're inside a car has nothing to do with rubber tires. A bolt of lightning that's gonna cut through a mile of air is not gonna care about a couple of inches of rubber and air. It's actually still mostly air, right? Uh, so wh why are you safe? So it turns out that the electric field that comes in towards your car uh, pushes the electrons in the car and it pushes them around. And the more it pushes some one way, the more build up there and cause a counter push back the other way. It gets electrons harder and harder to push. What happens is you have a really fast rearrangement of the electrons in the metal. And when are the electrons gonna stop moving? They're gonna stop moving when there's no more force on them, right? So when the electrons have built up a field that exactly cancels the field that's pushing them around, that's when they stop moving. And that's why inside of a metal, the electric field is zero. As long as you don't have an applied voltage like a battery that's causing current to flow, you have a zero voltage. So even something like a bolt of lightning, remember how many coulombs we have available just in a human body. Now think about how many are in a car. Just billions and billions of coulombs of electrons that don't have to shift all that far to cancel out an electric field, even something as strong as a bolt of lightning. So in a metal, the electric field is zero. And on the surface of the metal, the electric field is always perpendicular to the surface of the metal, which means, by the way, that when you have a smooth piece of metal, the electric field tends to be pretty spread out. But when you have metal that comes to a point, the electric field is really, really, really strong through there, which leads us to lightning rods. So if all of the excess charge in a metal resides at the surface because the electrons repel away from each other and the way to get as far away from each other as they can is to be on the surface. And charge tends to collect at sharp points. What happens at a sharp point is like too many people on a pier. A pier gets too crowded and then people get bumped and they fall off the end of the pier. Something similar happens with electrons. When electrons bunch up near a point and the electric field there is very strong, it's strong enough to tear the electrons right off the metal and chuck them out into the air. So pointed objects will actually bleed off electrons. The point of a lightning rod, again invented by Benjamin Franklin, 
The point of a lightning rod is not to attract bolts of lightning. That would be a ridiculous thing to put on your house. The point of a lightning rod is to bleed the electrons off, to lower the electric field strength near your house, to make it less likely that lightning strikes in the first place. Now the reason why you have the big cable attached to the rod going to the ground is that just in case lightning strikes, you'd rather have it go through the big cable than go through the walls of your house and start a fire. But lightning rods are not what people think they are. They are not designed to attract lightning. They're designed to prevent lightning strikes. One final point, electric fields are very easy to calculate. They're defined as the force per charge in an area, and so you take your force, you divide by charge, and you get an answer. It's in Newtons per Coulomb, which has no special name.